Hope not hate expose is an obvious parallel construction. A parallel construction, if you don't know, is what law enforcement and journalists do when they want to hide their sources. Let's say you're a journalist and you obtained a crucial piece of evidence by legal means. Perhaps you contacted a farm shop owner and got them to break data protection laws and reveal customer data, even trying to solicit this as a crime, I might add. So what do you do? You make up a plausible story to explain how you got that evidence legally. An anonymous tip-off, a social media post of a distinctive-looking cat, you were able to trace anything. What's great about parallel construction is that with a decent amount of care, nobody can gainsay you. And for the most part, if you're the right person exposing the wrong person, nobody who matters will gainsay you anyway because they're just glad that nasty person got their comeuppance and don't care how it happened. Remember, Lomez, another anonymous Twitter account, got doxxed, and this was also by The Guardian. So, very interesting. So, how did Hope Not Hate find out who Charlie Dale was? How about the American or British government? How about both? I'm not joking. I looked a little deeper into Catherine Long, by which I mean I went on her LinkedIn profile. Ivy League graduate, check. Seven-month internship at the State Department, check. US aid posting in Tajikistan, check. Specialist in Central Asian languages, fluent in Farsi and Tajik, check. I got no further with her than that, but I was it was enough to convince me that she is, at the very least, a suitable candidate for an intelligence contact in the media. Put it another way, she glows. Then there's hope not hate. And again, a little digging goes a long way. The group is ostensibly a charity and therefore a non-governmental organisation, but its links to the British government are no secret. Hope Not Hate receives a significant amount of money from the British purse, public purse, which I've documented. In the Retrustees report for 2019, it states that Hope Not Hate briefed multiple departments in the Home Office on emerging trends in UK hate, as well as briefing the Home Affairs Committee and presented a keynote at the Home Office Conference on online hate in Derby. Jason Razor Giorgiani has alleged Hope Not Hate is a direct front for British intelligence at home and abroad, i.e. MI5 and MI6. In 2017, Giorgiani was caught in an undercover sting in a New York bar by a Swedish Antifa activist working for Hope Not Hate. Giorgiani lost his teaching job at the New Jersey Institute of Technology and subsequently sued the university. He maintains that the sting was at the behest of British intelligence after he left alt-right corporation in the immediate fallout after Charlottesville. And again, just to state it, Yes, the people at Charlottesville were reprehensible. Yes, it's tragic that the activists on the other side died in the car collision. <clears throat> Anyone chanting anti-Semitic phrases there, I don't have any truck with. But, focus on that. Focus on Charlie Dale's claims, because you could be forgiven for being sceptical, right? For saying that there are intelligence connections here which have not yet been documented. Just because other people are alleging it does not make it true. Notice... His profile on Catherine Long. <clears throat> the elements of that do share elements of people that I have met that work for the State Department, their career histories. I met a chap that does hostage negotiation in the US, for example, and another guy who had done it historically for the CIA, and they all have very similar backgrounds and demeanors. So it's not impossible to build a profile about a potential person with an intelligence background. Do we have evidence that hope not hate? have those people on staff, or at least connections to the intelligence services. Well, according to the CV provided by Shuckman for his fictional identity, Christopher Morton, Morton apparently graduated from Manchester University in 2023. Now, what's interesting is Manchester University actually publish their annual graduations online. And if you control F this document for their degree congregations in July 2013, that is linked down in the description, there is no Christopher Morton there. So we know that, of course, Harry Shuckman's identity is fictional and that Harry Shuckman didn't go to University of Manchester. What we do know from his remaining profiles on other websites that weren't scrubbed clean before his undercover investigation is that Shuckman graduated with an undergraduate degree from the Department of Middle Eastern Studies at Cambridge University and an MA in Terrorism, Security and Society from King's College London. Cambridge and King's College London, Department of Middle Eastern Studies, MA in Terrorism, Security, and Society. And this is credited in here, in the following paper by the Frederick Ebert Foundation. Frederick Ebert Foundation for Social Democracy, by the way, is a think tank named after the first president of the Weimar Republic from 1919 till his death in office in 1925, member of the Social Democratic Party. This was published in 2023, so the same years that Shuckman was going around, giving out this false identity with his passport. Page 15 of the PDF, as you can see here, Harry Shuckman is a freelance journalist and writes Scout, a blog about conspiracy theories and far-right extremism. He's a former news reporter at the Times 
and recently finished a master's degree in terrorism, security, and society at King's College London. So he finishes a degree in terrorism, security, and society, subjects that the intel agencies are most interested in, immediately goes on an undercover sting operation against the far right around the world, uses a false passport to construct a false identity to present himself as an alias to those organizations. Said passport is very convincing. Said passport could have only presumably been procured through either illegal means or with government assistance. Again, I'm not alleging anything. I'm just saying that this looks strange. Very strange. And I think that when the authorities investigate this, which they should, hope not hate, should be made to provide answers for this, especially considering the public are paying their bills via the Home Office. Now, sources have also relayed to me the following information about Shuckman's family, which may be of interest. So this is his father, David Shuckman. He is a former BBC News science editor. He's now an independent consultant for things like journalism and climate reporting. His father was at the BBC for 38 years, from 1983 to 2021. So Harry is a Nepo baby. So perhaps there's a little bit of upper-class guilt working in there, considering he constantly goes after folks like Tommy Robinson, who could be accused of being imprudent, given his history of repeat offending and his admitted use of drugs. Um, but those who support Tommy Robinson, who haven't committed any crimes, who are just articulating their opposition to mass immigration and the factual existence of Muslim rape gangs, let's say, not as eloquently as someone who graduated from Cambridge and King's College London might have liked. There might be a little bit of privilege that he feels guilty there for to punch down on members of the working class, but... What's interesting about his father's background is, in 2002, his dad was diplomatic correspondent for the BBC, and David Shuckman authored an inaccurate article, which wrongly alleged that a shareholder in a Congolese diamond mine owned by Oryx Natural Resources was the same person as an Al-Qaeda associate who was jailed for his involvement in the 1998 bombing of a US embassy in Africa. So David Shuckman made the mistake of two people, merged those together, and caused reputational damage to Oryx Natural Resources. Oryx sued the BBC, and the case was settled for a sum of over £500,000 at the time. And it's ironically from The Guardian that we get this information in this article called BBGBs from March 2002. And what's really interesting in this Guardian article is the following. So they say, As BBC News celebrates its ratings boost in the wake of September 11th, a troublesome hangover from the same terrible event is refusing to go away. The Oryx affair, the blunder that led to the incorrect identification of an African diamond mine shareholder as an Al-Qaeda fundraiser, is eating away at the consciousness of news executives. After the disastrous broadcast on October the 31st, 2001, the BBC sought to establish what went wrong. Now, having admitted the error, efforts are concentrated on minimising the extent of the damages. The BBC has concluded that the affair was a catastrophic but rare failure of journalistic first principles, rather than an endemic problem in the news division. A dramatic story, fed by murky secret service propaganda, provided the kind of scoop that was so desperately sought. The report wrongly alleged that a shareholder in a Congolese diamond mine owned by Oryx Natural Resources was the same individual as an Al-Qaeda associate jailed for his involvement in the 1998 bombing of US embassies in Africa. No response was included in the report from Oryx. On the day of transmission, an email was sent asking for a comment. Oryx attempted but failed to make contact. The company could have disproved the BBC story. One key question is why the BBC was so sure of its story. The basis of this report was supplied by Brian Johnson Thomas, a freelance journalist, billed on screen as an intelligence expert, who is said to have good connections with the security services. It was taken on by respected diplomatic correspondent David Shuckman with the backing of editor Mark Popescu. A theory is that Johnson Thomas's MI6 sources were at least not questioned by Shuckman's contacts in the Foreign Office. An interview with FO Minister, Foreign Office Minister, Peter Hayne was included in the report in which he explained the government's concerns that profits from conflict diamonds were being channeled to Al-Qaeda. 
While he did not mention Oryx, ministers were keen to underscore the global threat of terror to justify military action in Afghanistan. Right. So his father has sources who have sources, allegedly, according to The Guardian, with connections to MI6. And his father has an in at the Foreign Office. This may explain why, if this false passport was not procured through criminal means, he was able to procure a convincing passport for an alias to conduct his undercover investigation. His grandfather, as well, the father of David Chuckman, was Harold Chuckman. Now, Harold Chuckman was born to Jewish immigrants who left Tsarist Russia in London. Uh, he appears to have a, a lifelong fixation with communism, conducting his PhD thesis at Oxford on a Polish socialist party called the Jewish Labour Bund, and publishing and translating numerous books on Soviet communism. Now, in the Hope Not Hate documentary, uh, Harry decided to explain his reason for why he is so motivated to attack the far right. And of course, they say far right, what they really mean is Nazi, but you can't accuse Simona Malcolm Collins and Jonathan Anomaly of being Nazis because they're ethnically Jewish and that would be absurd. And Schuckman decided to speak about the persecution of his Jewish family members in the likes of the concentration camps in Poland. And this clearly affects him deeply and for this I express my sympathies because this never happened to my family, but I can't imagine the pain that must be running through that family having lived with that memory. But at no point does he make reference to his grandfather being a spy? I'm not joking about that. His grandfather's son, David's brother, Henry Shuckman, is an academic. And he wrote about his father in a book called One Blade of Grass. And I'm going to read an excerpt from this book. Quote, My father, a historian in Russian studies at Oxford University was offered a fellowship in Helsinki and took his family with him. From Helsinki, Russia was less than a day away by boat, across the Gulf of Finland. It was the Cold War, and when a message came through from Cambridge Circus that my father was to travel to Leningrad on urgent business, he didn't hesitate. Although he was a quiet Oxford man, like many Russianists at that time, he also did occasional work for the circus. Namely, MI6. He was a part-time spy. Mum and Dad went together. They disappeared across the water, into Soviet wastes, leaving the kids in the care of a Finnish au pair. Again, Harry Shuckman's family have intelligence connections. There is no proof that Harry Shuckman himself has worked with intelligence agencies, but his academic career would be making him a candidate to join an intelligence agency with his vast knowledge of counterterrorism. His grandfather was a spy for MI6 against the Russians, and his father seems to have had MI6 contacts, at least one sphere removed, while working for the BBC for 38 years. Very weird. He's not the only member of Hope Not Hate to have uh, intelligence connections as well. Baroness Ruth Smith, who we've mentioned before on this show when I was covering Hope Not Hate's political insulation from criticism and why they get so much funding. Baroness Ruth Smith was the director of Hope Not Hate Limited uh, until the 11th of July 2024, former Labour MP, now a Baroness of Stoke-on-Trent. Why I mention Ruth Smith is because in this was 2011, during the WikiLeaks saga, it was revealed in the ter Telegraph that a communique sent from a U.S. embassy on April 24, 2009, reported that then-Prime Minister Gordon Brown had planned to go to the country when Labour rose in the opinion polls after the G20 summit in London to call a general election. The plan was called off after it emerged that Damien McBride had sent emails to Labour aides containing unfounded allegations about the personal lives of senior Tories. Mr. McBride was then forced to resign. It's a scandal. The intelligence about a surprise election came allegedly from an unlikely source, Ruth Smith, the Labour candidate for Burton at the last election. American diplomats in London clearly took Smith seriously, as her name was followed by a recommendation to strictly protect, in quotes, her identity. Ruth Smith, strictly protect, told us 
April 20 that Gordon Brown had intended to announce the elections on May 12th and hold them after a very short, brackets matter of weeks, campaign season. End quote. That was the communique. The cable was classed as classified, confidential, not for foreign eyes. Why is Ruth Smith of interest to the American intelligence agency? This is a domestic matter about UK elections and when they need to be called. If Gordon Brown was improper to call the election at that time, this would be a matter of the UK Parliament, wouldn't it? Why are the American intelligence agencies interested in Ruth Smith? No answer. There's other government involvement, and I hope I hate right now as well. This is why I'm worried to report on any of this, frankly, because what's really funny, bitterly ironic, is that Hope Not Hate, throughout their farcical documentary, have lots of poorly edited cuts about miking up and adopting pseudonymous identities and wearing little hidden cameras and fearing for their lives when getting the far right drunk and getting some of them saying silly things that I do not support or stand by. I'm genuinely worried about reporting on this because it basically just puts me in the crosshairs. And yeah, sure, they've already done a a farcical profile on me after speaking to Liz Truss for saying sensible things about why we might not want to import Palestinian terrorists into our country who don't like us for establishing the state of Israel in the first place. But let's say that the intelligence agencies are interested in Ruth Smith, who's connected to Hope Not Hate and was sat on their board. Let's say the intelligence agencies have a familial connection to Harry Shuckman. Let's say Hope Not Hate have now taken notice of the fact that I shared the redacted passport. That's ironically a target on me. And we know again from a 2018 Swedish government report that they outsource their dirty work to violent Antifa mobs. So yeah, I don't particularly feel safe, but there you go. Necessary to get it out there. And I also don't feel safe because Hope Not Hate are embedded into the government. So this is from Guido Fawkes. Uh, Government whip Anna Turley is both a director and member of Hope Not Hate's board of trustees. Labour MP Sarah Owen is vice chairman of the group's parliamentary group, made up of only Labour MPs, so not exactly a bipartisan charity there. Another of the campaigning organisation's directors also happens to be a prominent Labour MP. Uh, This is the TUC communications director, Antonia Bantz, and chairman of its trustee board is newly elected Labour MP, Gurinder Singh Josan. So four Labour MPs, a Labour baroness, and an invitation to Parliament at the height of the civil unrest during Southport, when Nick Lowell's had already posted the false information about an acid attack in Middlesbrough that led to people going out onto the street on the day where other gangs had committed violence in Birmingham. These people are sponsored by the government. They take our tax money to do this. They harass members of the public who have been not accused of, suspected, or charged with any crimes. They present false identities to them to gain the trust of whether you like their views or not honest people who are just speaking their mind. And they attempt to ruin their lives and smear their reputation in blogs, broadcast, and print. And they seem insulated from consequences because Nick Laws, to my knowledge, hasn't been questioned about the false information he spread online because of connections to the government, if not degrees of separation, intelligence. So, hope not hate may have committed a, quote, false and threatening communications offence. An offence against the Official Documents Act. And they've certainly violated the impartiality expected of charities under the Charities Act 2003. Still waiting on whether or not Fraud Action will investigate them. The Metropolitan Police referred me onto them, so they did not follow up on that specifically. But nobody's, as far as I know, has been questioned about prior stuff. They still have their charitable status. They're invited to Parliament. Nobody's been arrested or charged. So you might understand why I'm worried to even report on this. Because it seems that Hope Not Hate are beneficiaries of preferential treatment especially funding by the government, civil service, 
perhaps the intelligence sector. So I bring you this report at the genuine expense of my own safety. So quite ironic that hope not hate like to LARP as intrepid journalists doing the right thing to fight a phantom far right threat when they themselves have the most powerful allies you can possibly imagine. Thank you for watching that clip from Tomlinson Talks. If you liked that and you would like to see more, you can get the full 90-minute show every week on a Wednesday afternoon, live from 3 p.m., only on lotusesis.com and all of the other content that my colleagues produce behind the paywall for as little as £5 a month. Thank you very much for supporting us, and I hope to see you there. Until next time, goodbye.